Welcome back folks. So we're now moving on to the final unit in philosophy 1150. In this final unit we're going to be constructing proofs in quantificational logic. It's important that you understand what you're doing though when you construct these proofs. So that's why I put emphasis on our being able to symbolize those symbolic sentences so that we know what this stuff means instead of just blindly manipulating symbols. Okay, to review. We started off in sentential logic with eight basic rules, ten equivalence rules, and two subproof rules. So there's our 20 rule system. We're going to continue to use all 20 rules. When we move to quantificational logic, there's going to be four new quantifier rules. There's going to be two rules for taking quantifiers, or what I refer to as quantifier bound variable pairs off, and two rules, one for each quantifier, for putting quantifier bound variable pairs on. So I'm going to start off explaining that. Then we've got one quantifier negation rule, and that's all we really need. Five new rules in combination with the 20 rules we already had. So the first new rule is called universal instantiation. The abbreviation, capital U, capital I. So universal instantiation is the rule that enables us to remove universal quantifiers and the bound variables that go with them from sentences. There's a two-stage UI procedure that I hope you'll find easier and straightforward to understand how to apply this rule. So the first stage, remove the quantifier bound variable pair and all accompanying brackets that have no further role. So, in this first sentence, we have a simple sentence, everyone understands English. This isn't true in general, but it might be true of a group of people in a particular room. So, if we want to remove the universal quantifier and bound variable, what we will do is remove that, as well as these decorative brackets. There are no other accompanying brackets. So that's the first stage. So, if we're at line 6, we will do one UI, that's what we'll put in the justification column. All four of the quantifier rules are one-line rules. So, you put the line number followed by the abbreviation for the rule. The second stage of the UI rule, replace, substitute, insert, or instantiate, that's why they call it universal instantiation, all occurrences of the same bound variable in the first stage with, and then there are a couple of choices here. So, in this easiest case scenario, my specifying it in this way is a little bit of an overkill because there only is one kind of bound variable, but when we get to slightly more complicated situations, you'll see why I specified the second stage in the way that I did. So, the first choice is you replace, substitute, insert, or instantiate the name of a specific item or individual, and remember we reserve the letters A to T for this, in the slot that was previously occupied by the bound variable. So, we might decide to put Adam's name in that slot. So here is our first UI going with the 2A option. So we started off with the sentence, everyone understands English, 
And from that, by UI, we inferred, Adam understands English. We could do as many different UIs as we had a need of. We could also put Frederica's name in that slot. That would again be one UI. If we had a purpose for doing this, and generally we don't, we could have a whole string of UIs. The second option to be here, instead of putting the name of a specific individual in the slot, we might use a free variable to put an unspecified individual in that slot. So, if you recall, we're using letters U, V, and W for that purpose. So, one UI once again, the sentence would look like that. And to get the concept across most clearly, we can read it in a somewhat cumbersome sounding way. Unspecified V speaks English. Again, ask yourself, is it or is it not impossible for this sentence to be false, unspecified V speaks English, if it's true that this sentence is true, everyone speaks English. Because we want all of our rules to be valid. We don't want to allow ourselves to be making inferences where the information we start off with is true and the information we infer from it is possibly false. So, UI, clearly a valid rule. Now, we can move to a slightly more complicated situation. Suppose the sentence says, everyone understands English and everyone understands French. Everyone in a particular room, let's say, understands both English and French. So, this is clearly not true in general. It might be true of a particular group of people. So, if we want to do a UI on this second sentence, we remove the quantifier bound variable and the decorative brackets that go with it. We also, in this case, remove the brackets that are around the conjunction because those brackets are there to indicate that the universal quantifier applies to the entire conjunction and not just to the left conjunct. So, stage one, we end up with E blank and F blank. Again, we might want to put the name of a particular individual. Let's say we put Steve's name in there. So this is going to be 2UI. We started off with the sentence, everyone understands English and French. If that's true, then by UI we could validly infer, oh, so Steve understands English and French. In the third sentence, if we do three UI, here we have a simple sentence but this simple sentence contains a two-place relation, X knows Y, but in the outermost slot we've put Frederica's name, so all X are such that X knows Frederica, more colloquially, everyone knows Frederica. We might do 3UI, where we remove the universal quantifier bound variable pair, and the decorative brackets, in the X slot, we might decide to put Adam's name. So, everyone knows Frederica. By UI, we validly infer Adam knows Frederica. Okay. We move on to question four. Here we've got a universal quantifier ranging over a conditional where we've got a simple predicate 
or sorry, a simple sentence with a two-place relation is the antecedent, and a different simple sentence with a two-place relation is the consequent. So this sentence might read, All X are such that if X knows Frederica, then Frederica owes X money. In other words, everyone that Frederica knows, she owes. In this case, we remove the quantifier bound variable pair and the brackets around the conditional that indicate the universal quantifier ranges over it. So we end up with K blank F horseshoe O F blank. So that's going to be 4 UI. We might put Steve's name in those two slots. If Steve knows Frederica, then Frederica owes Steve. If it's true that all X are such that if X knows Frederica, then Frederica owes X, then it has to be true that if Steve knows Frederica, then Frederica owes Steve. So, another valid UI. Finally, we have a situation in line 5 where we've got two quantifiers ranging over a conjunction. So sentence 5 might stand for, for all x there exists a y such that y is a female and y is the mother of x. Everyone has a mother who's female. So if we want to do a ui and remove the universal quantifier in the bound x variable, this is a situation where there's still going to be the existential quantifier with the y bound variable. So we remove one quantifier at a time. So we'll put there's at least one y such that y is a female and y is the mother of blank. That's the first stage in 5UI. So, once again, we could put Adam's name in there. There's at least one Y such that Y is a female and Y is the mother of Adam. Or, we could also put, there's at least one Y such that Y is a female and Y is the mother of unspecified V. That again is going to be 5 UI. So there's an explanation of the first quantifier rule, the rule for taking off universal quantifiers and putting either the names of specific individuals or free variables indicating unspecified individuals in the slots previously occupied by bound variables that match the quantifier we took off. <clears throat> Having set out the conditions for the application of the first quantifier rule, universal instantiation, we move on to the similar existential instantiation. A number of things are exactly the same as the universal instantiation, but as we're going to see, there are some important differences. So, I've now made a change to the description here. Existential instantiation, like universal instantiation, also has a two-stage procedure. The first stage, where we remove the quantifier bound variable pair and all accompanying brackets that play no further role is exactly the same. But when we come to the second stage, things are going to be a little different. We still replace, substitute, insert, or instantiate all occurrences of the same bound variable as the quantifier that was removed in stage one, but we no longer are eligible to put 
names of specific individuals in that slot. The reason for this is fairly straightforward. Let's suppose I did an EI having to do with a group of people, and it was determined that at least one person in the group drives a Tesla. Suppose I inferred, well, in that case, one EI, Steve drives a Tesla. That's clearly not a valid inference. Pretty easy to think of a situation where at least one person in a group drives a Tesla, but Steve isn't that person or amongst those persons who are Tesla drivers. So we've got a problem here. The problem in general is that unlike UI, EI is not a valid rule of inference. There's lots of cases like this where we can make EI inferences and end up in a situation where the line we started off with is true and the line we ended up with after doing the inference is false. So, shouldn't we just get rid of EI then? Because remember, we only want valid rules in our system of inference rules. So from the beginning, we've insisted on that, only valid rules. Well, at this point, there's a little bit of a change for the following reason. We wouldn't be able to construct proofs for all the valid arguments in quantificational logic that there are if we didn't have an EI rule. Yet, EI is not in general a valid inference. So what do we do? Well, here's what we do. And every logic textbook does this in their own way, but they're all doing basically the same thing. We need to strategically impose a set of restrictions on when you're allowed to do an EI in order to eliminate all of the invalid EIs and leave us with only the valid ones. So that's what we're up to here. EI in general is not a valid rule, but we need EI, or rather, we need to use all of the valid EIs. So that's the plan as far as imposing some strategic restrictions. So, this is not a valid way to reason, and this invites the first of two restrictions that apply to EI. And that first restriction is bound variables can only be replaced with free variables, not with names, as I've done here. So after I remove the quantifier bound variable pair, when I'm putting something in this slot to replace the bound x variable, it cannot be the name of a specific entity. Because an existentially quantified sentence, unlike a universally quantified sentence, doesn't give us enough information to merit that inference as a valid one. So, what we have to do then, whenever we do an EI, instead of putting a name in the slot, is put a free variable. So now we're going from the sentence, at least one person in the group drives a Tesla, to the sentence, unspecified V drives a Tesla. We're not committing ourselves to who exactly unspecified V is, but we're only committing ourselves to there being some unspecified V. And this is a valid inference. If at least one person in the group drives a Tesla, it has to be true that unspecified V drives a Tesla. An unspecified V would just be uh, one of the one or more persons that make this first sentence true. So is that all we need? No names of specific items in the domain filling in the bound variable slot, but only free variables. Notice I've indicated this here with EI. Names are out. Has to be 
free variables. Well, we're almost there, but not quite, for the following reason. Consider this little situation. There's at least one person who drives a Tesla. There's at least one person who drives a Hyundai. So we do EEI on line one. Unspecified V drives a Tesla. And suppose we were to go on in parallel fashion to EI unspecified V drives a Hyundai. Everything would be fine as far as this restriction goes. We're not putting the names of specific individuals in that slot. We're putting a free variable. But notice what would happen if we, after doing the two EIs, did a conjunction. We would end up in the situation where unspecified V drives a Tesla and a Hyundai. This is also a problem because it's possible for these two sentences to be true. At least one person drives a Tesla, at least one person drives a Hyundai, but for it to be false that there's unspecified V, some unspecified individual who both drives a Tesla and a Hyundai. So, what are we going to do about this situation? Because we want to eliminate all possibility of situations where it's possible that the sentences we start off with are true and the sentences we infer by employing the rules are false. Well, here's where the second restriction comes in. Every free variable that's replacing a bound variable cannot occur earlier in the proof or another way of putting it, every free variable that goes in the bound variable slot has to be new to the proof. So as far as this second inference pattern goes, line three is fine, but line four runs afoul of the second restriction because we're putting a free variable in the slot that occurs one line earlier. And in fact, that's the source of the invalidity. If we were to put the same free variable in the replacement in line four as we do in line three, we would be presupposing that one and the same individual both drives a Tesla and a Hyundai. That might be true, but we're certainly not entitled to suppose that given the information we have. So all we need to do then is just put another free variable in there, W let's say. Then when we do a conjunction, we'll end up in a situation where unspecified V drives a Tesla and unspecified W drives a Hyundai. It could be the case that unspecified V and unspecified W are one and the same person, but there's no necessity of that. We're not committing ourselves to that. Thus, if these two lines are true, it's impossible for line five to be false. So that's all we need to do in order to strategically restrict existential instantiations so that we only allow valid ones. So, UI, then, is the quantifier removal rule that's always valid. And because it's always valid, we never have to place restrictions on when we're allowed to do it. We can replace the bound variable slot with the name of any individual, with any free variable, regardless of whether or not it occurs earlier in the proof. With EI, though, because it's not always valid, we need to make sure that we always follow these two restrictions so that we only do EIs that are valid. So again, the first restriction, no names or bound variables can replace, or sorry, um, bound variables can only be replaced with free variables not names when we do an EI. Even further, 
every free variable that is replacing a bound variable can't occur earlier in the proof. It has to be new to the proof. So, if you like, we can compress these two restrictions into one. Every valid EI has to be a free variable that has not occurred earlier in the proof. So that's all we have to keep in mind. Every time you do an EI, it has to be a free variable, and it has to be a free variable that has not occurred earlier in the proof. So there we have it, the first two of our quantifier rules for removing quantifier bound variable pairs from sentences. Existential instantiation and universal instantiation. We've gone through universal instantiation and existential instantiation. Those are the two rules for removing quantifier bound variable pairs. Now we'll move on to the first rule for putting on a quantifier bound variable pair. The name of the rules for putting on quantifier bound variable pairs are generalization rules. So we've got existential generalization and universal generalization. It turns out that existential generalization is the generalization rule that's always valid, and because of that, it has no restrictions. Universal generalization is a little more complicated to explain because I have to set out the strategic um, restrictions we have to make sure we're following so that we only get valid instances of UG because UG, like EI, isn't always valid. We're going to start with the easy one though, existential generalization. It's got a two-stage procedure which is more or less the reverse of the two-stage EI procedure. So, the first stage, we remove all occurrences of, and we've got two choices here, the name of some specified individual, that'll be the letters A all the way to T, or a free variable indicating an unspecified individual. So we remove either the name or the free variable, and we put a bound variable that's not already on that line. So that bound variable can be in the proof, but what's important is that it's not already on that line, and we put that bound variable in the place of the name or free variable we've removed. Then we put a quantifier bound variable pair with the same bound variable as the one we put in stage one on the leftmost position of that line with all accompanying brackets. So let's consider a number of examples. Simplest case scenario. Jack was born in Germany. Well if Jack was born in Germany at least one person is born in Germany, so we can do one e.g. on line one. So we leave the one place predicate, we take out Jack's name, and instead put a bound variable that's new to the line. Since there aren't any bound variables on that line, I'll just put X, then we put the existential quantifier with the matching bound variable and our decorative optional brackets. So that's all that's necessary for the simplest case scenario. Jack was born in Germany, by EG we infer, well at least one X, namely Jack, was born in Germany. So, 
That's obviously a valid inference, no problem there. We can move to a slightly more complicated situation where the name we're removing occurs not once, but twice. Here, we might have Jack was born in Germany, N drives a Maserati. So from that we can do 2, e.g., where both occurrences of that one name get replaced with a bound variable not already on the line. Once again, I'll go with x. Then we put a matching bound variable with the existential quantifier and the optional decorative brackets. In this case, we also need a set of brackets around the conjunction to indicate that the existential quantifier with the bound x variable ranges over the whole conjunction and not just over the left conjunct. Third situation, we've got a free variable instead of a name, unspecified v was born in France and drives a Tesla. The procedure for an EG will be exactly the same. Instead of removing the name, we remove the free variable. And once again, we put a bound variable not already on that line in the same place. Here, just because I can, I'll put a y bound variable. Could have put an x again, could have put a z. The important thing, just make sure that the quantifier you place on the line has the same bound variable as the bound variable you used to put in the place of either the free variables or the names you removed. And once again, we're going to need brackets around the conjunction to indicate that the existential quantifier ranges over the whole thing. All right, in line four, here we've already got a universal quantifier with the bound x variable. All x are such that Frederica knows x. Here we can do an EG and what this would involve is first, oh, I've got Frederica on the innermost slot, so I remove the innermost name Frederica, leave all of the stuff having to do with the universal quantifier and x bound variable exactly as it is, and pick a bound variable that's not already on that line. So in this case, x is already on that line, so we'll put y in there, and then we put the existential quantifier with the y bound variable, so that gives us 4 eg. So from the sentence, all x are such that Frederica knows x, by eg we infer there's at least one y for all x such that y knows x. And again, if line 4 is true, then line 9 must be true. Okay, finally we've got a situation where we've already got one existential quantifier in place. There's at least one x such that x was born in Spain and unspecified w drives a Maserati. So, in this case,
we leave all of the stuff pertaining to the bound variable x exactly as it is and we're just going to be doing an eg on the free w variable. So everything's exactly the same except we removed the w. We need to put a new bound variable in that line just because I can. I'll put a z there. Could have just as well put a y. The important thing is that the bound variable paired with the new quantifier I'm putting on the line, this one has to be exactly the same as the bound variable letter that I replaced the W with. So that's going to be 5 eg. So that is the first of our rules for putting quantifiers on our existential generalization rule always valid no restrictions finally we can move on to universal generalization which has the same structure as existential generalization but we've got three restrictions that we have to keep in mind We move on to universal generalization, the last of our four quantifier rules. So, like existential generalization, universal generalization is used to put quantifier bound variable pairs onto sentences. So, as far as the first stage goes, you'll notice that I've crossed out the option of doing UGs on the names of specific individuals. So that's designed to eliminate the following kind of situation. We start off knowing that Taryn was born in France. If we do a UG on line one, where we remove Taryn's name, put an X in that slot, and a universal quantifier with a matching variable, we end up with the sentence, everyone was born in France, which clearly doesn't follow from the claim that Taryn was born in France. So that gives us our first restriction on UG. No UGs on names. UGs on free variables only. Is that enough? Well, not quite for the following reason. Suppose we have a sentence like this. There's at least one person who was born in France. On line two, we can do an EI. At least one person was born in France, so by EI, unspecified V was born in France. Then, we do a UG on line 6 so that we get all X or such that X was born in France. Notice we've complied with the first restriction. No UGs on names. We did that UG on the free variable V. But something's got to be wrong here because we started off with the information in line 2. At least one person was born in France. And in line 7 we've got everyone was born in France. Clearly 7 doesn't follow from 2. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the second restriction isn't followed. No UGs on free variables coming into the proof from an EI. So, anytime an EI is done 
and a free variable is introduced into a proof as a result of that EI, that free variable is permanently banned from having a UI done on it. So, what other ways could a free variable come into a proof? It could come into a proof as a result of an EI or a UI, and when it comes into the proof as a result of an EI, that's a problem. Another way a free variable can come into a proof, though, is as a provisional assumption starting a subproof. This situation is a little more complicated to illustrate, but if we only want to allow valid UGs, but at the same time we want to allow all of the valid UGs that there are, then we have to have this temporary restriction. So, consider sentences three and four, nice and straightforward. All X are such that if X was born in Surrey, then X was born in British Columbia. Four, all X are such if X was born in British Columbia, then X was born in Canada. So, suppose we started a subproof, provisionally assuming SV, unspecified V was born in Surrey. So that's a provisional assumption. Notice you probably aren't going to make this provisional assumption in order to do the simple inference I'm doing, but this is just for illustration. Now that we've got unspecified V was born in Surrey, we'll do two UIs, and remember UI is unrestricted, but we'll want to do those UIs in such a way that we're going to have the same subject in all three of the sentences, namely unspecified V. So, unspecified V was born in Surrey, then 3UI will give us, if unspecified V was born in Surrey, then unspecified V was born in British Columbia, if unspecified B, V sorry, was born in British Columbia, then unspecified V was born in Canada. From here, 5, 6, modus ponens, unspecified B, V was born in British Columbia, then 7, 8, modus ponens, unspecified V was born in Canada. Now, here's where the third prohibition comes in. Suppose someone were to do nine UG so that they get all X or such that X was born in Canada, Then they exit the subproof to get the sentence if unspecified V was born in Surrey, then everyone was born in Canada. So that's 5, 10, CP. This is not a valid inference to come up with. If some unspecified V was born in Surrey, then everyone was born in Canada, doesn't follow from these two sentences. And the problem was that we did the UG before we exited the subproof. So no doing UGs on free variables 
that started a particular subproof. Here's the important thing though. While you're still in that subproof, so that's a temporary restriction. If we finish off this inference in an appropriate way, then five to nine CP will give us if unspecified V was born in Surrey, then unspecified V was born in Canada. Very important that in line 10 we have exited the subproof where unspecified V came into the proof as a provisional assumption. So we weren't eligible to do the erroneous UG I illustrated earlier, but This UG, where we take out the two instances of V, put the bound X variable in there, put a universal quantifier with a matching bound variable, and finally put a set of brackets around the conditional to indicate that the universal ranges over the conditional, we have a sentence in line 11 all X are such that if X was born in Surrey, then X was born in Canada, that does follow from lines 3 and 4 alone. So the fact that we used V as a provisional assumption doesn't permanently bar us from doing a UG on V, but it bars us from doing a UG on V while we're still in the subproof. So just a review here. No UGs on names, only on free variables. Second, though, no UGs on a free variable that came into the proof from an EI. And that's a permanent restriction for the rest of the proof. There's also the temporary restriction. No UG on a free variable that uh, came into the proof as a provisional assumption to start a subproof while you're still in that subproof. So that's a temporary restriction. So that gives us then our four quantifier rules. UI and EI for removing quantifier bound variable pairs from lines of information symbolized in quantificational logic. UG and EG for putting on quantifier bound variable pairs from information symbolized in quantificational logic. From here we can move on to consider the quantifier negation rule. We arrive now at the fifth and final quantifier rule. It's called quantifier negation. The abbreviation is QN. The best way to think about this rule is to think in terms of switch, switch, switch. Here's the situation. There are three different locations in a quantified sentence where there's going to be two possible ways it could be. The first one, immediately before the quantifier bound variable pair. There could be a tilde in front of that quantifier bound variable pair, or there could be no tilde. More broadly speaking, there could be an even number of tildes. Let's say there were three tildes. By double negation, you could reduce it down to one. So you're going to get a situation where there's either going to be a tilde or no tilde. So the first 
switch to make with the quantifier negation rule, if there's a tilde before the quantifier bound variable pair, remove it. If there isn't one, put one there. The second switch is the quantifier itself. There are only two quantifiers, so it's either going to be universal or existential. If it's universal, change it to existential. If it's existential, change it to universal. The third switch is immediately after the quantifier bound variable pair. Again, there's either going to be a tilde between the quantifier and the sentence it modifies, or there won't be. If there is a tilde, remove it. If there's no tilde, put a tilde there. Let's consider a number of simple examples. So the first sentence, it's not the case that there exists an X such that X speaks Swahili. There are no Swahili speakers in the room. We could do a QN on that sentence, and we'll see a little bit later the kinds of situations where it would be to our advantage to do a QN on a sentence like this. Is there or is there not a tilde before the quantifier? There is, so we remove it. Second issue, is it an existential or a universal? It's a universal. Third, is there a quantifier immediately, or sorry, is there a tilde immediately after the quantifier bound variable pair before the sentence it modifies? No, there isn't, so we put one there. And SX stays exactly the same as it was. So that's one QN. As always, we need to consider, is this a valid inference rule? Well, we started off with the sentence, it's not the case that there exists an X such that X speaks Swahili. We ended up with the sentence, all X are such that X doesn't speak Swahili. These two sentences are equivalent. If this one's true, it's impossible for this one to be false. So QN is a valid rule of inference. The second situation, in a particular group, it might be the case that there exists at least one person such that they don't drink alcohol. If we do a QN on that sentence, tilde before the quantifier or not? There isn't one, so we put one there. Existential quantifier, we change to universal. There is one immediately after the quantifier, so we remove it. As a result of doing a QN on 2, we started off with the sentence, there's at least one X such that X doesn't drink alcohol. We ended up with, it's not the case that all X do drink alcohol. Equivalent sentences again, so if this one's true, impossible for this one to be false. The next kind of situation got a quantifier both before and after the quantifier bound variable pair with a universal quantifier. This sentence might indicate it's not the case that everyone doesn't drive. So that's equivalent to the sentence if it's not the case that everyone doesn't drive, then there's at least one X such that X does drive. So that's 3QN. And the fourth example, everyone speaks French, let's say, if this is true of a particular group. So there's no tilde before or after the quantifier. So we put one, and we change the universal to an existential, put one after, and the fx stays the same. So that's 4qn. Everyone speaks French. 
by Qn we get, it's not the case that there exists an X such that X doesn't speak French. So, in all four cases then, the sentence, if the sentence we start off with is true, it's impossible for the sentence we end up with when we do the switch, switch, switch of Qn to end up with the sentence that's false. So, since quantifier negation is always valid, no restrictions arise here. Broadly speaking, there's another important issue that I want to draw to your attention. And this is the following. If you recall, way back in sentential logic, the eight basic rules can be applied to entire lines only, whereas the ten equivalence rules in sentential logic can be applied to entire lines or parts of lines. When we move to the quantifier rules, we've got the following. The four quantifier rules, that is, universal and existential instantiation, as well as universal and existential generalization, can be applied to entire lines only. And the QN rule, like the 10 equivalence rules, can be applied to entire lines, or you can apply it to parts of lines. Very important to keep this in mind, because we're going to be doing some proofs a little bit later on, where it might be tempting to apply the quantifier rules to parts of lines. But that's not in general valid, and you're going to be penalized substantially if you do that. So I give this warning in advance because a surprising number of people have done that in the past. Okay. That being said, we will leave our consideration of the quantifier negation rule by noting the following. Do you remember Aristotle's square of opposition? So we've got A-type sentences, all Canucks are Swedish. E-type sentences, no Canucks are Swedish. I-type sentences, some Canucks are Swedish. And O-type sentences, some Canucks are not Swedish. Now, just using our intuitions about what the symbolizations meant, we were able to satisfy ourselves that each of these pairs were equivalent. Now we're in a position to provide proofs that they're equivalent. So let's start with the A-type sentence. So we've got all X are such that if X is a Canuck, then X speaks Swedish. So that'll be our premise. So, remember, all of the equivalence rules, as well as the QN rule, can be applied to parts of lines. So, first thing we will do is apply a QN to that line. So, no tilde before the quantifier. The quantifier is a universal, so we change it to an existential. No tilde after the quantifier, so notice where it goes between the quantifier and the brackets surrounding the sentence it modifies. Everything in the brackets stays exactly as it was. So that's one QN, and that particular construction a little bit difficult to get your head around. It's not the case that there exists an X where it's not the case that if X was a Canuck, then X would speak Swedish. Nonetheless, though, we can strategically employ the rules we've learned to demonstrate that if this sentence is true, then this sentence must be true. So, what we do next, then, is Leave everything in the line exactly the way it was, and do two implications. So that's going to give us 
tilde CX or SX. Then we do three De Morgans. So it's not the case that there exists an X, that's going to stay exactly the same. Then we've got this negated disjunction, which is going to become a non-negated conjunction, but we're going to add a tilde to both sides, so we're going to end up with that. Finally, a little neatening up procedure. Just on this very small part of line 5, 4, double negation, tilde tilde CX is going to become CX. Thus, in four steps, we've proven that if this sentence is true, then this sentence has to be true. If this sentence is true, then this sentence has to be true. So proofs can be constructed for each of these four types of sentences going in both directions. Thus, our rules work out nicely and they give the equivalencies that strike us as the correct ones intuitively. So there we have it, the five new quantifier rules. Together with our 20 sentential logic rules, we're now ready to begin to construct proofs. So there's going to be another video coming out in a day or two where we're going to consider situations where we're strategically employing some combination of the five quantifier rules as well as the rules of sentential logic in order to construct proofs. So there's a number of concrete insights to be demonstrated that can really only be demonstrated in the process of proof construction. So very important though that we get all five of the new rules under our belts so that we can use those along with the 20 rules of sentential logic.